Okay. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Once again, welcome to our second session. I hope everyone had a good break, a, a little mini break and stretched around. We'll be here for a while. And in this presentation, we will be with Dr. Padela, who is going to be presenting today. He is an ER doctor as well as a community health researcher and a bioethicist. His focus is on improving health and healthcare through better accommodating religious values in healthcare delivery. He is also the professor and vice chair of research and scholarship in the Department of Energy of Emergency Medicine, as well as he is a professor of bioethics and medical humanities in the Medical College of Wisconsin. He is also a board member of the Initiative on Islamic Medicine, and he is our partner and co-investigator of our EMPART project as well. In this session, Dr. Padela will be exploring our the Moss PCOR toolkit in more depth, as well as the he will describe the Muslim dimension of the patient-centered research. The floor is all yours now, Dr. Padela. Thank you for having us today. Thank you for being here today. I think you're on mute, Dr. Badela. Can't hear you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My apologies. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu rasulullah wa la alihi wa sabi ma wa It is really uh, an honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, and truly, I'm grateful for the previous session. It shows how far we have come in so little time. And I'm heartened by the ways in which both you, Fatima, and the Warrior Free community, but others around uh, uh, in our community and beyond have incorporated the principles of patient-centered outcomes research into their daily living, whether it be in the community space or whether it be in the clinic space um, or whether it just be in their social space. So I'm really heartened by that. Uh, today, my honor is to present parts and aspects of the Mosque PCOR Toolkit, which is truly a framework for engaging in and work that I think will help address Muslim health and healthcare disparities. You heard a little bit about me, so I'm going to proceed. I will want to warn you that our talk today, inshallah, will be of three parts and it will be a little long. I hope to kind of uh, engage you at different points, uh, inshallah, Tana. So I still need your help in monitoring the chat and there'll be points where I'm gonna, you know, I can break and, and answer questions, inshallah, to keep it uh, engaged. No worries, so I will definitely help. Thank you. So, so with that, let me just give you a background for a second. You know, as I mentioned, the, that I am uh, the, one of the directors of the Initiative on Islam and Medicine, and this is the scholarly approach that we have taken uh, over the last 15 or so years, right? So our interests are in thinking about three main sort of sectors, the Islamic tradition, biomedicine, and Muslim practices, and our research is, and scholarship and education is at this junction between these three. And to do that work, we are involved in doing three sorts of large um, programmatic forays. And the first one involves thinking about Muslim patients and the way that they engage the healthcare system, specifically how Islam, both in terms of its values, its beliefs, and actually the identity of being a Muslim, uh, engages with sort of Muslim behaviors in the healthcare system. We do work around how Islam animates the practices of Muslim physicians, as well as the bioethical challenges that they face in the healthcare system. We are drawn, which are drawn and addressed by, drawn from their Muslim identity, addressed by the Islamic tradition, perhaps. And in the ways that Islamic scholars think about biomedicine, right? The way that they write about biomedicine and the edicts that they issue. So our focus has been on looking at Muslim behavior on one end, right? In terms of Muslim patients and healthcare providers and generating Islamic bioethics interventions. So it's multidisciplinary work that involves empirical, textual, and theological methods. And the goal of all that research, right? Which is sometimes a bad word in our community, but the goal of generating new knowledge, if I say it that way, is to affect interventions, both in the community setting, particularly in mosque settings, and I'll explain to you why that is the case, as well as in the healthcare setting writ large, right? To ways to accommodate Muslim identity and better serve the Muslim community in all of its dimensions. So that's the work that we've taken, and that's how the IMPART and the EMARSH project that you heard about, uh, it was part and parcel of that foray. So today's talk will have three parts. I also like threes, Samia. So um, the first we have Muslim dimensions of health, which you've heard this term uh, several times throughout our two-day symposium. The second part, we'll talk about the history and need for the mosque-based peak or toolkit. So I'm gonna set for you how this all came about in a, in a brief way. And then in the end, I'm gonna take you through a guided tour of the toolkit. Now I will say, and inshallah, Asna and others can put the web link to the toolkit in the, in the chat. Um, 
you know, I won't go through all aspects. So it's, it's a short document, but it's a, it's a heavy document. And if I were to go through it all, you would be in the 26 hours of training that we provided to community health workers. And we certainly don't want to do that today, but I'm gonna share with you some, some aspects of it that might be of relevance for you as engaged stakeholders, both community activists, academicians, researchers, and, and, and just patients and, and providers at large. So let's start off with kind of a centering notion of Islam in America, right? A diverse population. Uh, you know, this is a Newsweek in 2007, um, which is interesting. I know several of the people here uh, who, who were in the shot, but you know, we've been talking about Islam in America for a long time, particularly in the last 20 years since 9-11, there's been more focus on that. And what do we know? You know, when we think about Muslim Americans, just knowing this is actually important because we didn't know or prior to 20, uh, 2001, there was very little understanding of who Muslim Americans are, right? So certainly it's a growing population of three to five million people. It's projected to double in, in, in 2050. So like very quickly it would become a huge, larger population. We know it's diverse as you saw that picture, right? It's diverse ethnically and racially, comprised of three major groups, as you well know, African-American, South Asian, and Arabs. And as a diverse immigration history, you know, this, this number is sort of changing. It used to be two thirds foreign born, one third native, and now as we have a population that's growing and young, we see this coming to almost 50-50, potentially by 2050. That ha half of the Muslim Americans are born here, half of them have immigrant, immigrated from elsewhere. In terms of socioeconomic status, I want to make a mention of this, right? Oftentimes the character of Muslim Americans is sort of bipolar, which is the case that there's well off to do individuals, right? 14% of the population is, has household in incomes over 100,000. But then there's another group, right? Uh, nearly half, which is in, under the poverty line, 30,000, right? So we have this sort of bimodal distribution of income within the Muslim American community. But what is often missed is that 87% of the population is English literate. Those even who immigrated here are English literate. So a lot of our work is focused on language translation, right? Which is certainly an important thing, but I will say that there's a religious translation, there's a cultural translation that's potentially more important and then more important to the larger swath of the community. And obviously uh, the community, because it's a group that's aggregated by religion, has high levels of religiosity, right? So we see here when compared to the American population in general, Muslims are likely to say that the religion is more important to them, right? 69% here say it's very important compared to 58% in the United States generally. And then half of the population attends a mosque weekly, right? And a mosque community, I'll explain what that means in a few slides, but that's actually a huge proportion of the population compared to 36% of Americans that you can compare it to. So we know this, and we know this because of, of Pew and uh, you know others who have done this sort of work to demographically profile the Muslim American community in a cost-effective but cost-intensive way, right? Millions of dollars went into methodology to get a population-based representative sample of Muslim Americans. Now, we know that, and that's, that's a great thing, but if I were to ask you a question, does Islam influence American Muslim health and health behaviors across these diverse lines? Or relatedly, I were to ask you, are some health beliefs and healthcare experiences shared by Muslims simply because they share the same faith? What would your answer be? And I would argue that, and I know we can't engage on this platform as we like, but I would argue that you would say, yes, of course, that's the case, right? But what I'm going to share with you and, and those who are in the eMarch and Empire project know I use this slide a lot, um, that while we might think so, but I don't think generally speaking, people would say that's the case. And what do I mean by that? I mean that a Muslim community member, I say, of course, our religious identity impacts the way we think about health and health uh, healthcare seeking. We, so for us as a community member, that might be unknown known, meaning it's, un, it's unknown to the external community, but it's known to us, right? And I will say from the external community, the uh, opposite perspective, that's known, right? But it's an unknown, meaning that we know, we think this, but it's unknown to us. There's no data to support that. And our projects over the last you know, five years have been trying to make move those two things to a known known. We know how religious identity impacts health and healthcare seeking and healthcare disparities in most Americans, right? We wanna make that explicit. And we don't all, not just know how, but the what, what percent of the population, what aspects of the population, right, is it important to? So that's the project, right? We wanna generate knowledge. So when I say research, this is what I mean. Create new knowledge that can be helpful to the community at large. And that's an Islamic imperative, that's a, a social imperative, both of them come together there. So we're gonna start with this sort of notion. You've heard about this idea of Muslim dimensions of health, and I'm gonna just take you through the theoretical background for that, right? Which is self-explanatory, but sometimes just needs to be reinforced, right? When we say the term, what do we mean 
when we say the term Muslim? We mean a group of individuals with some shared characteristic. And what is that shared characteristic when we say Muslim? Well, we're pointing to some identity, some aspect of identity, a religious identity, some religious commitments, some shared experiences that this group might have because of that identity, some values that they might share, some history they may share, and some beliefs, all drawn from the well of religion. Right. So that's what we're talking about when we say apply the label to a group of Muslim. But this is a lumping activity, right? We're trying to lump people together, and that might be pejorative, but I don't mean in that sense. We want to aggregate people together, right? To, because they'll have some shared characteristics that are the same in group, but different from those outside of the group. There's something specific about Muslim and health or Muslim health compared to Christian health or non-Muslim health. And that's what we're trying to foreground in the work that we're doing. So one way to do this, and again, for those who are part of these uh, knowledge and dissemination projects, then you know this, I'll share it for the group here, that when we think about how we construct clinical reality, and this is a, a anthropological social scientific perspective from Arthur Kleiman, which is very useful. He's a psychiatrist and a physician at Harvard. He talks about the idea that we move as, a, as individuals from el illness to wellness through discrete domains of healthcare systems, right? And, and these healthcare systems have their own explanatory, uh, sorry, system, so explanatory mechanisms of health and disease and illness, social rules, interaction, and norms. But they're different ones in any society. And there are three domains that are particularly important and present in all societies. He did some cross-cultural studies. What are they? Well, there's a professional domain, which for us becomes an allopathic healthcare system. You go to a hospital or to a clinic, right? There's a popular domain. So you interact with family and social networks and community when you're seeking some cure to some malady that you perceive, right? And then there's a folk domain. You might engage in alternative complement to healers and treatments. So take the example of someone with a headache, right? Well, I have a headache. I might go off the shelf and take some Tylenol, right? That Tylenol is in a popular domain. I might have a severe headache. I might go say, well, I, this Tylenol didn't work. I'm going to go to, the, to my doctor. My doctor might give me something more potent to do, right, for that headache. That's the professional sector. I'm, or I might talk to my cousin or my father or my mother and they should say, well, have some tea with honey, right? Or have some black seed, this isn't some hadith. And that's the alternative or complementary healthcare system that we're engaging with. So just for that little malady, I'm engaging with three different systems. Oftentimes we dominate discourse based on the professional system. But the reality is that most of health and wellness occurs in the populist domain not in the professional domain. So here's a figure from his uh, seminal land-breaking, um, a path-breaking work around uh, the cultural construction of reality. And what I wanna point out for you here again is this, you see the circles, the larger circle occurs in the popular domain, the professional sector and the folk sector are smaller aspects of moving from illness to wellness. All right, so how does that now play a role for Muslim Americans? I asked you and I provocatively that we might not know much about about Muslim American health, but we assume that that things uh, that the Muslims across race, ethnicity, geographic lines, even countries, right, would share some notions based on their faith. And what do they share here? So this is from a work of mine. But the explanatory model for health, disease, and wellness is shared. Right? There's a God-centered view of healing. You all know this, but also who the actors are in that moving from illness to wellness. Doctors are one source. Imams are one source. Families one source. Community is one source. These are sources of healing. This is from empirical work that we conducted many years ago, just like the Kleiman's model, right? And there are different means to get healing, right? There's worship, there's, there's medicine that we would consider traditional medicine, herbs and text-based practices. These all produce healings. They're all ways to move from illness to wellness, shared across the, the, the demographic differences in the Muslim community. There's a notion of construction of health, that health is not just physical, spiritual, and also social. Sometimes spiritual feelings can lead to physical maladies. These are belief structures within the Muslim community. And there's a construction of what is disease, right? Oftentimes we label things as disease, like infertility, or, or, right, or we treat things like pregnancy might be is seen as a blessing, so we're not in favor of contraception. I'm not saying that we aren't. I'm just saying that there are these notions of what is illness and what's disease. Is pregnancy a malady? Is infertility a malady? This is thought about through an explanatory mechanism of faith. So the other domain is an ethical legal framework for treatment, right? This again is shared across the demographic profile of Muslim communities. So certain behaviors are motivated and are restricted, which impact health seeking behaviors, but also health of the community. 
and again, this is all stuff you all know, but I'm just making it explicit for us, right? Reduced alcohol consumption means that there's some benefits potentially to this community versus others, or restricted notions of when abortion can be done might lead to different types of a community profile, right? Um, and the notion that seeking healthcare is not generally obligatory also impacts the way you think about the healthcare system. The other notion is that the, there is an ethics and a, and a legal construction of how we should partake of treatment or what types of part, treatment we can partake of. So an example here, we have porcine-based medicines, right? We're talking about vaccination today. Thankfully, the COVID-19 vaccination does not have porcine gelatin within it, nor does the flu this year, the Flurix formulation. But attitudes towards vaccination are informed by, well, what are the ingredients in the vaccination? And is that an ingredient one that is prescribed by our faith? The third area, right, which is getting more and more pressed these days, thankfully, is this notion of a socially mar uh, this notion of a socially marginalized identity that's at risk. Simply by being a Muslim in America, you're conveyed some health risks. That's the reality. Just like if you're an African American in America, there's some health risk to you. We have data on that on the on the, on the of a latter, but not the former. And there are some papers here to suggest this notion that post 9/11 discrimination and abuse and Islamophobia impacts the health of a community in many different ways, including psychological ways. So, so, uh, so now that was a simple question, right? That we think we know in the Muslim community, but I would argue and I, that there is no data necessarily to support this writ large in the in the landscape of healthcare. And a simple, another simple question: What is the health status of the Muslim American community? Can we answer that? And relatedly, do Muslim Americans suffer from health inequities and healthcare disparities? Again, this is something that we would think, oh yeah, of course, this would be the case, but we're here, right? This might be known within the community, but it's certainly an unknown outside of the community, meaning there is no data to support this. There is little data to support this. So while we might think this is something that should be taken for granted, I would argue in this project, the MPART project is based on this notion that we need to first understand and identify whether these things exist and then make it explicit. Why is that the case? Well, in the United States, right, the healthcare disparities are tracked based on law and policy. The American, the uh, Agency for Health Research and Quality, AHRQ, creates a National Healthcare Disparities Report. This was after the initiative, uh, not the initiative, the Institute on, of Medicine, which is now called the National Academies, wrote a landmark report in 2001 around two eras humans. So now we tracked through legislation healthcare disparities on two ways, right? In access to healthcare and the quality of healthcare. So what occurs outside of and then inside of the healthcare system. But the way that we track it amongst the population is by race, ethnicity, or social economic status. That is the mandate legislatively for this agency. Now, religious influences therefore are missed. Right? We're not tracking by religion. We're not funding by religion. We're not thinking about religious communities. And there are some assumptions to that, right? The assumption is that social experiences and cultural values are shared by race and ethnic groups, not necessarily religious groups, meaning what? That if you're an African American in this society, your social experiences will be similar to other African Americans because of that racialized identity. And then, if you're, for example, African American, you might have some cultural views that are shared by other African Americans. You're similar to other African Americans, therefore, we should track disparities. There's other things beyond this, but based on that, you can take the same thing for some other community, right? Um, Hispanics, for example. But we think you're more similar than someone who doesn't share your race. Right? That's the idea. Now you can make the same argument for Muslim Americans. A Muslim who's from Palestine, right, as an immigrant, and a Muslim who's from Pakistan as an immigrant, maybe they share the same social experience because they are of the same faith and their immigration status. But we don't track that, right? And the other issue is, largely speaking, in our postmodern world, culture is foregrounded. And we imbibe this, that like culture drives everything, right? But we recede to the background of religion, right? Meaning in this case that a Somali, you heard today, Somali Americans will share something because they're both an ethnic group and their culture of Somalis will be, of the Somalia, right? Of that group will be dominant in the discourse of how we think about any healthcare behaviors. But the fact that they're a religious community as well is background. And I, this is a problem for then answering the simple question, right? Does do most Americans suffer from healthcare disparities? And here's the illustration of that. So many years ago, myself and a mentee of mine 
tried to get a sense of what is the landscape of Muslim healthcare disparities, and we just looked at the standard literature that you look at, Medline literature, to see how many studies there are. So this is what we found. If you just look and do a general search with the MeSH terms included, Muslim America and health disparity, at that time, right, the study's dated now, you only found two articles. And then if you added the term just, you know, disparities, not health disparities, you get 10 articles in the premier database for health research. That's it, sum total. And, and now, right, 11, 12 years after, if you were to look at the, do the same thing, you'll find that most studies that come up, there are more than this, these number of articles, are still non-representative, right? They are, don't represent a large swath of the community. They're not even drawn on methods that are representative. So some small sample from some community center. You can't generalize it to anything, right? And then it's not prevalence focused. We wanna look at mental health stigma, for example, and from three you know, community centers that serve Muslim Americans in some city. It's just prevalence focused. We wanna identify something. They're not focused on intervention or understanding the causes for that, just that Muslims smoke more, or Muslims do this, or some sample that I got, right? Has this disease state or this uh, predilection. And they're often missing this Muslim dimension. And what do I mean by that? I, what I just sort of said, and you'll hear more from me in a few minutes. The idea that there's some aggregate notion, that there's some way to aggregate a community based on their faith is missing. And the, the evidence of that is, I'll show you, for example, in a few slides, that, that when you report these studies, they're talking about an Arab identity or a South Asian identity. And when they're doing studies and the study themselves, when you do the intake surveys, there's no notion of religiosity playing a role or religious beliefs. So generally speaking, from we're talking about PCORT, right? Patient-Centered Outcomes Research. So for the issue for patient outcomes research in the Muslim community in the United States is that you can't find American Muslims. And by that, I mean national statistics are not present. Religious affiliation is not captured in national databases or administratively or health surveys. These are sponsored by our government or premier institutions. Religious affiliation is not part of that. And if you were to try to use naming algorithms, for example, on the cancer database, uh, SEER, Right, they, you can't really get at Muslim Americans that way because there's low specificity. Every time you put in a term, it can be a person that you got that's not Muslim. Uh, uh, lack of regional capacity. So there's minimal infrastructure from the community setting, from CBOs, mosques, and clinics that are connected. Right, we don't have data sharing or data understanding, or, or even platforms to do that. I know this is one of the PCORI goals uh, in the future, but we can't conduct research that's systematic longitudinal because we don't have the infrastructure to do so. And then lastly, as I just mentioned, this is the Muslim dimension, right? We have poor measures of Muslim or Islamic influence upon health. Most of the measures that exist are based on a religiosity worldview that's Christian in nature. That does not easily apply to Muslims. And, and I can talk more about that in the Q&A. But one example would be fatalism, right? Fatalism is seen as a, as a resignation, but in the Muslim tradition, fatalism, quote unquote, would be an active thing. And so we might see someone's fatalistic about health, it can a negative connotation. But if I were to say you totally rely on God for your health, that has a positive connotation. So when you use measures that are based on a different worldview, you're not going to get a good signal, or you're going to get a signal that doesn't have the kind of depth to it that you need. So that's the past, right? That's the problem space of why Muslim American uh, health, generally health research, that healthcare disparity research is challenged. And what we are focused on is the future. We want to have a solution space, right? How we look at this landscape and affect change. And the way to do that was through mosque-based approaches, right? So if our challenges are finding Muslim Americans or assessing Islamic influences on health, we felt, right, that the mosque would be a place to address these two. Why? Because we can get at a religious identity in mosques. People who, are, who aggregate around mosque communities, right, have a notion that Islam is a part of their identity in some sort of way. And we know that mosques have, um, there's their centers where there is mixed mosques, meaning there's multiple races ethnicities present, or there are mosques that have singular dominant ethnic identities. So you can assess mosques, you can assess communities across this shared identity, or you can compare different mosques and say, okay, well, this you know African American mosque and this South Asian dominant mosque are there things that are similar? And as I already mentioned to you, that nearly 50% of the population aggregates around mosque communities weekly. So it's a huge uh, cross section of the community. And then the hope then is that that work can influence patient centeredness within healthcare systems. We understand what's going on, what the needs and the, and the, and the values and the beliefs and the disparities are in the health setting. We can address them through the healthcare setting. 
right, and that's the backdrop of the solution, right? One of the solutions was to create this MOS-based patient-centered outcomes research toolkit to help MOS communities right, engage in health programming at one level, but then also healthcare research programming at another. And that's the idea, right? So now I will say, uh, tongue in cheek, that there would be another way to go about this, right? It would be to go do work in, in, in restaurants, right? Or, or Muslim butcher shops, right? And so that would be another place where you can aggregate Muslim communities, or uh, you can find Muslim communities of diverse ethnicity and geographics and race uh, and the social economics. But what was interesting here, and I just want to give for a second, right? There was this sort of work being done in Chicagoland in Devon. And the idea had been to try to get um, the Muslim community to put uh, caloric labels on the items in, in restaurants. I'll leave it to you to see what happened with that work, but I'm gonna focus on mosques today. All right, so I already mentioned this and let me just kind of reinforce the idea. The mosque context is important to Muslims generally speaking because it's central to Muslim life, particularly in the United States. Nearly half of the community, uh, as the mosque community, hosts the mosque hosts educational, social, and health, as well as religious functions. Now, when I say mosque community, I want you to understand that I mean a community, right? The social network. Mosques are have Sunday schools, Islamic schools adjacent to them. There's social circles and networks that meet at mosques, right? Might be a Friday night football group that meets at the mosque or uses the mosque playground. And some mosques are clinics, right? There's uh, free clinics that are attached. That is the mosque community. People interacting with that physical plant, right? In some sort of way not just the prayer hall. And this is a site where there is a connection between beliefs and values and identity. That's where our religious identity is formed, particularly for the native population. So it's incredibly important within the religious life in the United States. Therefore, it's a testing ground for assessing how religion or religious influences across health across these lines. Again, this is my main takeaway, right? That that's why we went to mosques, that was a solution. And I still believe there's much work to be done and those of you who are connected to mosques communities, I would encourage you to think about how we can create a culture of, of health within mosque communities. All right, so now what was the culture before we started our work, right? Well, we do know that in many metropolises that there are faith-based health programs in mosques. Right? Uh, and we also know that the imams are involved in some sort of way. So this is from a study many years ago about how, what are the roles that imams engage in that are health forming or health influencing? And we know that khutbas can have health content the religious rituals that, that imams do have health influences, right? So births and deaths and so on and so forth. And they, they provide cultural sensitivity training. Oftentimes imams are called when the healthcare system has a crisis to help with the, being a liaison between religion and health and medicine. And then they also provide bioethics consultations for the, for, the, for, the, for the congregants. So they're all health influencing roles. However, these are in, uneven across mosques, right? Some imams don't do any of this. Some do a lot of it. Some have training, some don't but it is clearly a role that they can play. And for us, it became a strategic opportunity for faith-based programming. So what I mean by faith place is that I'll do a health screening in a mosque for diabetes or hypertension. What I mean in faith place is no, we want faith-based is that we want to have programming that is attuned to the religious identity of Muslims. It's translated for that identity. It leverages that identity, right? It's not just some healthcare system of service brought in as an extra site. And then we want to tend particularly to the religious dimensions of health behavior. So that was the idea that set up this notion that the mosque is a place where we want to create change in our community and bring an attention to holistic health. Again, spiritual, physical, and psychological dimensions of health. So the question was, or has been over the last several years, right? Can we actually engage mosques effectively? Can we conduct health quality, high quality health research in mosques? And then ultimately, can we teach that sort of modality and that methodology to others? And that's what uh, you know, Fatima uh, is sharing with you, that our successive PICO projects have been about this. And I'll just share for the moment that there's a paper that's going to come out in next week, I believe, that builds on, that shows that the, the outcomes from our eMarch project, right? The knowledge gain, the preparedness. And you already heard this morning from a, a couple of those eMarch uh, uh, alums around how they incorporated this learning into their future work. Okay, so, so P core stakeholders. One of the key ideas that, that the Institute has, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, is that there are many different stakeholders for health and that their goal is to bring all these stakeholders together on a singular platform because the idea is that when you have crosstalk, right, when you have sort of cross-disciplinary talk, not cross-talk, cross-disciplinary talk, you'll have better 
projects because they incorporate the views and insights from all these individuals who have lived experiences or expertise that is often missing. Not only that, but then you will also get at the patient-centered dimensions. You will put as primary what the goals are, the understandings are, the needs are, the values are of patients, and in some sense, their care caregivers as well. That's the idea embedded within PCOR methodologies. And I would say that those P core stakeholders, these are the nine categories here, are present in some way in our large mosque communities, right? So you have obviously patients and caregivers at the core of P core methodology, but also in the mosques. Everybody has been engaged with the healthcare system in some sort of way, either as a patient or a caregiver or someone who's ill. You have clinicians, right? And researchers who are in mosques. So that a lot of the doctors that we have in our community, and we're blessed with many, provide services, right? but some of them also do research on those services. You have in clinic, I already mentioned in many mosques, you have clinics or weekend clinics that are present. And so you have hospital healthcare systems and payers there as well. And then a lot of the mosques now, particularly the larger mosques in, metro, in Muslim metropolises, have these amazing uh, educational institutes attached to them, whether it be schools, whether they be you know other types of uh, educational institutions. So if you're going to satisfy these nine stakeholders, I would argue they're present in mosques. And that's the work that we have done with, in partnership to bring them all on a similar platform. Now with the four principles, and I, I think you've heard this, and you'll hear it again from me later on, but there are certain engagement principles that the Institute has put together for us to think about. First, that there's this notion of reciprocal relationships. Right? Decision-making authority in any project should be collaborative and clearly defined. Right? It doesn't mean that everybody has the same authority, but you have to decide who has what authority, right? A matrix relationship. And you define that at the outset. There should be co-learning embedded within projects, right? That community stakeholders should understand the research process and you should make that a goal and that's an outcome of the work. While the research team, quote unquote, right, will be driven by patient centeredness in terms of the measures that they employ, the outcomes that they're interested in, right? Not just their outcomes, but those that are of meaning and value to patients. And then there's true partnership, right? That, and in a way, this one of the ways that this uh, gets at is in terms of contributions, right? So you heard earlier today, one of the contribution can be around authorship, right? Uh, in papers, another could be actually valued fiscally for their time, and the data is, is shared, right? Um, there's from reflexivity, yeah. and then lastly, sorry, and lastly, this notion of transparency, honesty, and trust, right? That decisions are made inclusively with shared information and open and honest communications. You will not, every time a decision made, it's not a win-win, but you understand why it is a win for you, right? Meaning the healthcare researcher or, or, or the patient stakeholder. Now I'll add to that, that there's always this need for presence, right? That you all know that the way to leverage, um, uh, not to leverage, I'm sorry, the way to sh demonstrate that your, your value is through presence in community settings, right? And that that is really the idea that you listen with presence, you participate with presence, and the presence is always given. All right. So so I'm gonna get that's one aspect of the the PCOR toolkit, the moss based PCOR toolkit. But I want to take you back for just a few minutes and give you a sense of how that all came about, right? So even that moss based PCOR toolkit is research proven, right? Research tested, uh, because it, the field ground for that was the work that we did prior, right? So so before the toolkit was there. We had had some relationships, particularly this in Chicago land, um, with preeminent eminent mosque communities. This is MCC, MEC mosque community. So, though, and we partnered with them on a series of projects that I'll, I'll share with you in a second, that then led to the best practices that are now incorporated within the mosque-based PCOR toolkit. So these mosques, for example, and there are others as well, had a history of faith-based screenings, right? They were, uh, sorry, faith-place preventive screenings, diabetes, high blood pressure, so on and so forth. So there was always some notion of health programming within the mosques. They had active health awareness communities. They were doing educational programs on, on various health maladies. There was a diversity within congregations. So there were not just one dominant ethnicity, but multiple. And then robust intergenerational programming. I think those are the foundations for a great mosque partner, right? That they have intergenerational programming. It's not just catered at the, 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 the elderly in our community or just the youth, but every generation, parents and children you know, as well. There's this, these mosques had, there's this notion of practicality and feasibility within, within research. So obviously, if you have a physical plant that's, plant that's small, that restricts your being able to do certain types of programming. But these and others, mosques had large prayer services, meaning Friday prayers, but also classroom and seminar spaces to actually engage in educational or health work. 
And then I'll say, I mean, perhaps one factor was that when I moved to Chicago 10 years ago or so, I'd done work in mosque communities in Michigan. So there was some notion of trust that was already built up, right? That, that mosque communities and I know how to engage with them. And then particularly for researchers who are on the call here today, and uh, you know, there's some notion of actually first giving, right? Then taking or, or, or asking. So we had brought some pilot money from the University of Chicago at that time to set up some of the foundations, infrastructural foundations for research. And then there was some scholarly reputation that you're actually interested in that group, right? So when you go into a community, I'm interested in you as a community, not just me. Right? In this case, I'm interested in Muslim as Islam, not just you know some segment of that population or some partial identity that you bring with. So that body of work was dependent on also making prominent and foregrounding the Muslim or Islamic dimension of health, right? And so the study designs that we incorporated were always focused on this common religious identity, right? We sampled across mosques, right? Across, sorry, across race and ethnicity in diverse mosques to isolate or to aggregate that common religious identity. We're not just interested in South Asians or Pakistanis or whoever. We're interested in Muslim communities. Now you go across those markers and show that you are, demonstrate that, and get diverse communities together. We developed and utilized um, and validated measures that were based on Islamic religiosity, right? So not just off the shelf, uh, you know, measures that are embedded with different worldviews, but created and validated and adapted measures so that they were Muslim specific. Our data analyses focused on honing in religious beliefs and values. Again, the, the benefit of going to different mosques in your, in your research and in your programming is that you can leverage that shared identity. Um, and then our interventions were culturally tailored, I'm sorry, religiously tailored and centered, right? What I mean by that, they're set in mosque communities, right? But also that they leverage religiously tailored messages, right? In a theologically consistent and ethical manner. We want to not override your religious beliefs, not reform them, but to leverage them in ways that there is the health belief and the religious belief, I mean, the health outcome of those beliefs are tied together in a singular framework. Now that's a three R model. I know. Father and others have heard about that. I'm not going to get into that today, but it's part and parcel of the toolkit. And I encourage you to look at that. And, uh, and the last thing, sorry, I forgot. So you want to involve religious leaders in this program, right? If you're at a mosque setting, you have to think about religious leaders and religious identity. This is a good way to partner holistically with religious leaders in work. Now we talked about how you engage Islam in the health and the research programming and the design. The other aspect is to engage Muslims in mosque communities. And how do you do that? Well, it's collaborative design as the operating strategy. Right? We want to use the pre-core principles I identified and enumerated before, but we also want to set up multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary community advisory boards and steering committees. I'm going to focus on this point in a few slides after giving you guys a moment to digest what I'm telling you. Um, and, and, but this is incredibly important, and I'll tell you why. And then the, the other thing is that when we want to engage communities, you have to think about capacity building as a program model that what you're doing has to develop capacity in the community. That's a value add and a value must, right? That must be up front and center. So for example, in the work that we did, we always had peer educators, right? We weren't as the experts to living education, just. It was the peer educators, people we trained, people who understood the community, people who were liaisons, right? Who can speak from their own lived experiences. Actually, Fatima, one of the first ways we got involved, myself and Fatima Mirza, was through a peer educator model. She was one of our peer educators in our early work on breast cancer. Um, then we create replication manuals, right? So you've done the project, but now you want to empower communities to do and replicate the project and the program themselves. So you create replication manuals, and then you broaden the impact of your work. And then really, you know, uh, I'm an academic, you heard I'm a professor, so I'm interested in presenting conferences, but here, in this sort of work, you have to be interested in presenting to the community. Right, and really build in dissemination products that are relevant to the community. And I don't just mean one segment of the community. For example, we might present at Muslim health conferences, we might present at an imams meeting, you might present at a stakeholder for you know a healthcare system meeting that the community is organizing. And you want to share all that work again, a multi-sectoral work, because that's the primary aims, right? To empower communities, not just write an academic paper that someone will read, you know, uh, many years down the road. And lastly, partner grant proposals, and I think Picori is amazing about this, and you've heard today from several grantees that, you know, you have partnered grant proposals. These are collaborative enterprises, not just one-sided. So here are two, again, I'm not going to go in much detail here, but I want to share with you two sort of from soup to bowls projects, right, where we looked at two pressing health issues in the Muslim community over years. So what was the issue? 
the first issue was, well, we wanted to understand was, do Muslim women in Chicago suffer from breast cancer screening disparities? I mentioned to you, just answering that question is very hard. You can't get that from the databases that exist in the healthcare system. You can't get that from surveys that are done on cancer screening in Chicagoland. You have to go into communities and figure out this work. So we wanted to identify the issue, then develop the methods and to address that. So if they do, if they exist, then are they related to religious beliefs, values, and identity? This involves developing measures that are based on Muslim religious beliefs, values, and identity. If that's true, then can we address them through a religiously tailored mosque-based program? So that was five years of work, right? That you can see here, where you start off with build, understanding that, uh, sorry, eliciting whether disparities exist, then understanding from the community how you'd address them, and then you deploy an intervention. Right? And this work was funded by the American Cancer Society primarily. And I'll share with you some of that later on, but that's not the focus of our talk today. The other large project that we did was around, right, do Muslims have organ donation and transplantation related disparities? Because of their faith, again, right? So is this, is this related to religious beliefs, values, and identity in some sort of way? And then can we address them through a religiously tailored mosque-based program? So this is another body of work where we actually did an RCT, a randomized control trial in mosques, right? In both Chicagoland and Washington, D.C., thinking about can we increase knowledge and behavioral intent to learn the health benefits and risks to organ donation? Understand Islamic perspectives for and against, right? Ethically balanced. We weren't just doing one side of education. And we wanted them to understand how to, if they chose, how to engage with that notion. And the desired outcome was informed decision making, not signing up for, you know, the back of your ID card or license to donate, but rather you have the preparedness, knowledge, and means to do that if you so desire. So these are the two seminal projects. Again, this took three, four years of work as well. And that led to this tool toolkit, right? That we had actually a research laboratory. I mean, we did this work over, over many years and now we are delivering best practices so that you can engage with this on your, by yourselves, All right? I wanna make the, this explicit, not just known to some part of the community. So this is a toolkit. I'm gonna pause for one minute or two minutes to let you breathe, let myself breathe, take a drink of water. I'll address any questions that we have in the chat at this point, but now the last, last focus of this talk is actually walking through some aspects of the toolkit. You see the ones that I'm gonna go through that are highlighted. Um, the rest are not, I'm gonna not go through them given the time that we have, but I want you to kind of leave with some sense of what, how this will empower you to do projects in your own communities. So I'll pause for a minute, take a sip of water. And us, if there's a question that I must address since you're monitoring the chat, please just get off my uh, mute and let me know what I must address at this point. Yes, certainly. We have a lot of comments here. So um, I know Janice, she um, she sent an article, uh, a research article, I think. And um, she also said individuals who embrace Islam in U.S. are a population unto themselves, which I agree. <laughs> But I don't think we have any questions as right for right now. All right. So, so I'll continue on then, inshallah, and then we'll take questions at the end. So as I said, I'm going to go through these. I encourage you all, and I think you have in the, your chat probably a link to the, to the toolkit itself. So, so let me walk through some examples here of, of important features. So when you are embarking on a health project in the community, right? We have to think about mobilizing stakeholders towards that project. Now, it could be a research-oriented project. It could be a service-oriented project. Certainly, uh, with COVID-19, we thought thinking a lot about service-oriented projects, and that's kind of the dominant modality. And Dr. As I Padilla, let me stop you real quick. We do have one question. Please. Um, from Janice, and she's saying, what have been the largest barriers you have been addressing, engagement, and eliciting information for research? One of the largest barriers. Yeah, I get to that right at the end. Um, I think I'll say just to foreshadow that conversation, I think there are knowledge gaps and infrastructural gaps. So knowledge gaps, meaning the value of this work for us, right? Like what is the value? And so that's a communication issue gap, right? That we have to be able to put up front and center what the value is for the Muslim community to be engaged in this sort of work. And I'll say one of them is to own the narrative. Uh, to be a little provocative for a moment, a lot of our programming has been around mental health, right? Certainly it's important, right, for every community. 
but that might neglect other aspects of health. And when you have a caricature of the Muslim community, if I were to put up on a board here, all of the health research work that's been done by the Muslim community, for the Muslim community, in the Muslim community, you'll see a huge focus on mental health, right? And as an external stakeholder, what does that mean to me? What does that say to me? Say I'm a representative of, you know, some in some legislative capacity on a healthcare disparities panel. That most Americans have challenges in mental health, other stuff is not as important because that's the work that's being done by the community, for the community, in the community. And for those who want to have a more provocative narrative, they say, well, it looks like most Americans are maladjusted to society. It looks like their religion might teach them something or it doesn't is not appropriate for society because they can't deal, you know, they're getting mental health challenges. Their religion is not a coping mechanism for them. Right, you can generate a lot of narratives. And I guess, unless most community members and stakeholders are engaged in understanding the methodology research and doing their own work and how that is uptaken by others, we won't c control the narrative. Forget about controlling the narrative. We won't actually have accurate data. Because then you can have a consulting company do several focus groups in five communities and say, hey, here's a character of Muslims. This was illustrated by the Rand Report on Islamic religiosity. They, right, they did some work. No one had done any other, and they said, this is what the Muslim community is. You're extremists, you're this, you're that. Again, unless we are empowering ourselves, we're allowing others to generate narratives and generate data that will impact policies that affect our community. So that's knowledge gap. So the second thing is infrastructure gap. So we don't have infrastructure for research, and we rely on others to do things. So let me, again, provocatively, uh, <laughs> this is recorded, but let's be provocative for a moment. If you were to take the amount of money that most Americans spend on failed senatorial board legislative campaigns to get Muslims at the table and focus rather on developing programs in the Muslim community, for example, in mosques, I think you would have a much healthier community. Leave it at that. We prioritize ourselves developing infrastructure for certain things, campaigns and representation. But we don't know when we get represented what we will do because we haven't done the work to understand the needs of the community. Right. So I might spend a campaign to get someone elected in office, but then I say, okay, now help the healthcare system meet the needs of the spiritual needs of the unmet needs. I have no idea what they are because I never did that data work. So I said, I'll be provocative. Let me go back to my presentation and we can have more provocative comments at the end. So uh, back to mobilizing stakeholders, as I mentioned, so we have to be bring presence in, right? So, so listen with presence. And this is not some onerous methodology. Literally, it's just meeting and greeting individuals. I would ask you to think about an informal needs assessment. I know for our community health workers in this project, you were you learned formal needs assessment techniques from Rebecca Johnson and others, but you can do that in your meetings. So what are the challenges to life and health for you know, people that you meet with? You know, what are the successes and failures? What prior programming existed? And you can do an informal assessment of a mosque community, what's occurring, what's important to that community. Find potential partners, right? Who are the decision makers in mosques, right? There can be people who are on the ground doers who might be the most important, the ones who actually deploy employment programs or the titular leaders, right? Who sit on committees and board members. It might be the same individuals, sometimes they're not. And that's a clear learning for uh, individuals who are looking to create programming in mosques around health. So find those potential partners and then build a coalition. As I mentioned, a incredibly important technique is to build a multi-sectoral CAB, Community Advisory Board, I'll mention that in a few slides. Um, I just want to share with you, it's not just this notion, but when you develop this coalition, you can actually learn how to do work together. So today I'm focused on, on, on PCOR methodologies, but we've also done CBPR work, community-based participatory research, and I encourage you to look at that uh, modality and that toolkit as well. And when you partner on projects, you will learn things to how to design programs that are effective. Part of our work has been actually learning from them, giving the individuals in the community saying voice of how to create programming because they know what will be effective. Potentially researchers outside might not. I mentioned the four principles. I'm putting the slide up again just to remind you that these, these right, PCOR principles, I think, distilled down a lot of, of, of other types of principles into four common ones that we can affect in our engagement with the community. Now, I mentioned the currently point for us has been the Moss Community Advisory Board. And, and again here, right, why a cab? I think for three eyes, right, three eyes. Not the I as me, but the I's in this sense, right? So for one investment, when you have individuals who have agreed to be on a community advisory board, they're invested in your project or in not your project, our, it becomes our project, right? 
And I have in our work that we've developed actually in five minutes, we have uh, forms that you have to sign commitments, understanding what your role is, all of that up front, right? And, and project method, uh, project management methodology is relationship management here, right? Uh, and so you, you do that up front, so you're invested in a project. The other thing is insight. As I mentioned, a lot of individuals have lived experiences and insight and, and historical insight, practical insight. That's missed if you don't have a, a community advisory board. And then influence. Oftentimes our projects have been saved by the fact that an influential individual within our community advisory board went out and did the work and got people to buy into this project, right? That was shared. They're able to communicate value in ways that we as external members perhaps cannot. I think that's the, those are the three eyes of why a community advisory board. Now, you see on the slide here, again, just like you have many stakeholders and stakeholders or the nine groups from PCOR, you can get them all as part of your community advisory board. I think a multi-sectoral multi cap is very important. There are costs to that, but there are also benefits. Well, the costs to that, the costs are that not everybody speaks the same language, right? What are the benefits of that? That you'll get them to learn the same language and your, prog your, your project will be that more, much more impactful in the future, right? They will be, you develop the relationships that perhaps exist beyond the, the time of the project. Now, I want to mention a few things for a second. And again, unfortunately, our platform doesn't allow engagement in this sort of way. But you'll hear me speak on the Q&A. We can kind of take this up further. Certainly a key individual, potentially, right, in, in, a, in a community advisory board is the imam or the imams within mosques, right? The religious leaders, right? Who are, and, and certainly important are clinicians, right? So oftentimes in health awareness committees or health programming committees, there are physicians, right? Muslim physicians who are carrying out, conducting, designing these programs. Um, and often missed are these individuals, right? the patients themselves, the caregivers themselves, right? The mothers, the sons, the daughters of elderly or of children or the children themselves, right? You won't involve them in a cab, but they're representatives. Those are who are missing. Now, I'll say that, that you have to be very, uh, what's the word? Very focused on how you think about your community advisory board, not just who's at the table, but what voice they bring. And don't neglect the, the end user, so to speak, right? Because you have their representatives or their advisors at the table, bring them all together. Now here's a, a practical points and caveats, right? I mentioned to you that you, you should certainly have class, you should, certainly should have imams, you should have the, the voices of patients and the caregivers. So my pointer is that, that you, know, you have to maintain equity in voice. Now realize, right? that there oftentimes is not equity in voice. What do I mean by that? Well, doctors, I'm a physician, right? We say, trust me, I'm the doctor. I know, I'm the researcher, I understand methodology. And I come in with this expertise. In our communities, oftentimes, that's what ends up happening and that's what's expected. That the so-called leader, right, tells us what to do. Now that can help in crisis situations, which oftentimes we're focused on in our communities, but doesn't help in non-crisis situations. You don't have participatory buy-in, right? So if you're facing a crisis, that works. And we're often always facing a crisis, but in our health programming, we shouldn't be facing a crisis in that way. We shouldn't say just one voice, the imam or the doctor is gonna tell us what to do, then we're gonna implement it. The other issue is that sometimes people wear many different hats, right? So speaking for myself, I'm a clinician, I'm a researcher, right? I have some Islamic religious training. And so I can come in with this sort of monopoliz monopolization of all these hats at the same time. Say, look, I know in all these domains, just listen to me, right? I have to check that. And when you have people bringing, bringing those multiple hats in, you say to them, right, one perspective. One person, one perspective. You want to speak today as a clinician? Go ahead. As a researcher, go as a religious authority, go ahead. But that's it. One perspective, not multiple together, because then that will also dominate the conversation, right? Not that you can't advise, but when you're sort of speaking from an expert lens, try to maintain a single person, single perspective here, right? And so that you can listen to other perspectives. And then diversity, don't marginalize the marginalized. And I say that because oftentimes in our community structures, we have individuals who don't have voice and we marginalize them. Now, oftentimes this has a gendered component here, but it can also have a, um, a different sort of flavor. So one example would be that we want to create programming for individuals who have, um, you know, uh, limitations and mental capacity, but you don't bring them to the table because you think they can't voice issues. 
but you're creating to create a program for them or individuals who have domestic violence and we don't bring them to the table because we don't want to, right? We marginalize and marginalize it. We want to create programming that's more effective for them. I think you should avoid those sorts of inclinations. And lastly, you must focus on bringing people up to speed. As I mentioned, they don't speak the same language. So you must develop and put time into developing a shared lexicon. One key example would be for, uh, and from our work is the notion of risk. When I as a clinician say risk, I have some notion of epidemiology, of biostatistics, right? And I say risk. And I'm thinking about health outcome. When a religious scholar says risk, they're thinking about your akhirah, your najat, your, sorry, your salvation. Even the term means something different to them. And when you say, give me a religious ruling on so and such issue, again, you're saying, I want it based on my risk profile. And they're saying, yeah, all based on risk profile. You're thinking because you have diabetes, you are more liable to have heart attack. They're thinking risk profile, this person isn't praying. We got to figure out how they, right? They're thinking about something different. So be very, very clear on, on the terminology that's being used and the ways that you're developing the terminology. And, 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 then, and lastly here, incentivize. So the Supreme Court methodology talks about incentivization in certain ways. And I'll, next slide, we'll talk about that. So this is embedded within our engagement modalities, this notion of how you actually value the contributions of different individuals. And you mention them at front, right? That's the shared expectation that I'm going to have this level of engagement in a project. So for example, you can just be an informant, right? I'm gonna inform you on things, right? Or I can be a consultant, I'm gonna consult and be consulting on decisions. Or I'm gonna collaborate, we're gonna decide together and act together or stakeholder directed. You're going to be in charge of this implementation aspect or this research aspect of a project. Each one of these sort of four engagement activities deserve different levels of compensation, right? And the compensation doesn't have to be fiscal, it can be other ways as well, right? Co-authorship, presentation, right? Uh, uh, social sort of uh, accolades, but they're different levels. And pretty soon, if you're on the community advisory board, you'll know that not everybody has the same level of engagement. That's fine. Just up front, you say, well, what kind of engagement do you want to have? And then you decide what the competition level would be. And given the time, I don't want to go through this, but within the, within the toolkit, we actually give you examples of how you think about that in terms of three other levels, right? Consultation, involvement, and partnership. What would that mean for the mosque stakeholder that you're engaging with? And what would that mean for the PCOR stake researcher, right? How does that look? So, so I encourage you to go to the toolkit. Now, once you've identified right, a potential mosque community, you've gotten a stakeholders together, you've developed a community advisory board, how now do you think about engaging a project, right? Oftentimes, I'll say that the mistake is you go and say, I want to do work on this. But this is a key juncture. What is the work that we want to do together? The pre-work should be in your conversations, right? The community health assessment, the strengths and weaknesses of the, of the community, the SWOT analysis, right? You have been listening with presence. So you understand what's been done, what's important to them. So you'll be able to think about projects that are of value to the community, but you don't assume that. Right? And the post work of this would be the Muslim dimension, right? So, so let me give you an example from our own work here. Again, the pre-work is your engagement or the group's engagement with the community stakeholders. The post work is thinking about the Muslim dimension, which I just talked about, right? How is this a problem or that has a unique Muslim dimension? Because that's the one that we want to address in a patient-centered way. What's unique to the Muslim community here? Or what's most pressing to the Muslim community here? The real work in the middle is the research. What do I mean by that when you select a topic? So for us in our eMarch project, we had this group, this cohort of, of 15 and then enlarged to 17 at one point of stakeholders from different backgrounds. Some are social service oriented, some are clinicians, some are researchers, some are imams, some are religious leaders. And we asked them to think about what are the pressing issues in the Muslim community that the Muslim healthcare disparities or health disparities that can be addressed through peak or methodologies of the mosques. And they came up with this list right, of many different things here. Right. Again, obviously mental health was a clear and important thing to the community. Now from this, right, the real research is thinking about what aspect of this work we want to tackle and how. Do we want to do formative work and understanding the Muslim dimensions or do we understand them somehow and want to intervene upon them? That, right? And then when you do the work in part and fashion, you don't use the term research, I would advise you. We're generating knowledge together to better understand and address the concerns of our community. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are two aspects, right? The descriptive research or outcomes research. Descriptive research is sort of the first part, right? And this plays a part in the Kleinman's uh, model here. So if you think about Kleinman's model, you know, religion can contribute to a cultural construction of clinical reality by influencing the way people perceive, label, and evaluate their illnesses, right? 
That's descriptive work. How does religion influence health, beliefs, and behaviors? Now, Occam's work would say, okay, well, these discordant views of clinical reality or expectations can result in inadequate help seeking and improper clinical management. Right? So how do more or less religious groups fare with respect to health and health disparities? And you have to decide together as a group, are we doing formative work, descriptive work, or outcomes research? I would say that by and large, a lot of the work, even though it's small amounts, has been on descriptive, not outcomes. But you can't do one without the other. If you f identify a challenge, then you should think about how you address that challenge. So that's my practical advice, right? That you think about the climate's three domains and you do this in thick description to elicit narratives of moving from illness to, to health. And then that you develop you know, measurement tools within each domain to understand them. So let me give you an example, for example, right? For, 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 for our sake, to, as a teaching tool. If you're thinking about how Muslim youth deal with the complications of alcoholism, you can say, well, okay, is religiosity protective against alcoholism? That's one aspect, right? In the professional and in the sort of community space. Does a strong religious identity prevent help seeking? Now you're taking that descriptive work to what's happening in the healthcare system. Do imams provide a source of counsel or prescribe ruqya for alcoholism? That's leveraging a Muslim dimension. All these last three things are Muslim dimensions. Not just how many Muslim youth engage with alcohol drinking behavior. That has very little to do with Muslim dimension. It doesn't move you forward. It's just a data point. It's just prevalent study. These other three things are actually moving you towards outcome research, thinking about the Muslim dimension of this problem. Okay, so so now you've sort of thought about uh, and you're going to uh, thought about an idea or a topic, and then you have to think about well, what kind of PICO project are we going to engage with, right? So so this is again in PICO methodology. There's many different not PICO methodology, but all of these methodology, the different types of research. Descriptive to outcomes, but even within descriptive outcomes, there's a perspective research, implementation, dissemination, and comparative effectiveness. Now, let me walk you through an example here, right? So, do Muslims have lower cancer screening rates? Is a descriptive question. This is a descriptive research, right? Is this population have lower cancer screening rates? Now, how do we get Muslims to follow cancer screening guidelines? Is a is a implementation science right? research. Well. We know that guidelines exist. How do we help them get there? What's the issue there? With this cancer screening program, you have one that's worked in XYZ community, you want to bring it to the Muslim community, right? That's implementation and dissemination research at the same time. Right? So you're taking a program trying to adapt to the community. Lastly, is colonoscopy or fetal occult blood testing? And right? now you see the, the ads for Cologuard all the time, right? More effective in Muslims. Which one is it? That's comparative effectiveness. So you're taking two interventions, you're thinking about which one's better, more adapted, more effective for the Muslim community. I, there's, you can take hours of research, uh, of seminars on this idea, but I'm just giving you a sense of, okay, once you've divided, decided upon a topic, you're thinking about what, and then Muslim dimension, what type of work we want to do in the Muslim dimension. And this, I'm not going to go through this, but this is a model of thinking about when you've gone to that stage and think about what is the disparity you want to address. So this model, again, of ours thinks about how Islamic identity beliefs and values impact or can create health and healthcare inequities. Okay, putting it all together, given our time, you know, you are now at the stage where you've developed a collaboration. So the PCOR team, right, this has engaged and collaborated with mosque community stakeholders to identify the high priority issues in the community, various, various methodologies, right? Surveys or informal interviews or focus groups or town halls. And so now your focus, next step is, so this is, this is kind of the thinking about the identification and this is the planning and the conduct now. We are stakeholder focused, right? We are now going to engage with the community to think about how we actually create the program in the community setting. And then in the end, this is now dissemination, right? After you've done that work, now you want to disseminate to key stakeholders, right? You're focused on dissemination, analyzing the results of the study, engaging with those same community stakeholders, that same community advisory board, think about where is it important to present this? How do we present this? What's the narrative here? Who, who owns the narrative? So the toolkit has this amazing overlay. And I want to thank Fatima for thinking about this. Right, where we have three aspects of a research project, right, in a PCOR style, planning, conducting, and disseminating, what I just spoke about. But you also have, you know, these, 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 um, in project method management methodologies, you have these resource areas, right, where you can think about initiating a project and planning it, executing it and monitoring it and closing a project. So what we've done in the toolkit is mer uh, sort of merge these two, align these two, to say during the conduct and the plan, so the planning of a research project, you think about these process areas, initiation and planning. In the conduct of a project, you think about executing and monitoring the project. 
when you disseminate the project, you're thinking about how you close it. So you put these two together so that you can have a, a literally a toolkit for implementing projects in the Muslim setting. I will say, I want to give a shout out to the fact that PCORI itself, you know, it's been around, as you heard, since 2009, has developed methodology standards for each aspect of the research project, right? Engagement, their methodologies, research conduct, recruitment, their methodologies, dissemination, their methodologies for actually doing analysis, their methodologies. So I encourage you to think about the fact that they have a, we have a toolkit, but now this is a sort of a encyclopedia of how you think about methodologies for each phase of the work. In the end, I, I will also want to call out in this last project, the Empire Project, it's all about, not it's all about, but really centered around the community health worker. These individuals who will be the liaison, in our view, between the mosque community members, the healthcare system, and the research aspect. That these individuals who you train with various methodologies are the ones that are going to be able to bring them all together, right? And have the vocabulary to engage with each of these three circles in an effective way. They're central to this operation, right? And I encourage you to think about training community health research workers. Okay, I'm ending now, so don't, I know I've spoken for a long time. I wanna give you some practical insights from our projects that I mentioned to you already, the two large uh, studies that we did in most communities. The first one, as I mentioned, was on breast health. This is an intervention study, right? So it went from description to intervention. The intervention phase is what I want to speak about for a second where we identified a disparity in breast cancer screening and then we created a logistically tailored intervention to address it. So what I wanna to present to you now is some data of what the program looked like and then data from recruitment and retention and the intervention arm. So we had two mosques that were the intervention site. This was an efficacy trial. Um, and there was 10 days of recruitment per mosque to think about how we get individuals to be participating in a workshop that was of two half days right, and weekend mornings. Our criteria here were, uh, were related to the fact that we were thinking about breast cancer screening. So Muslim females aged 40 or over and fluent in English because our intervention was in English. So we recruited from these events at mosques 10 days for a two half day morning workshop and individuals were compensated on that. The other project, so this was an efficacy trial. This was a effectiveness randomized control trial where we had, a, it was randomized. So there's a, 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 a intervention workshop as well as a pilot control workshop. There's in four mosques, right, over two years, DC and Chicago. Now we had a little less recruitment there. Again, the same same events, right? But four to eight days at each mosque. And because we were looking about organ donation, it was anybody over the age of 18, both male and female. Again, the workshop was two half day mornings. Right? So this was successive projects in Chicago and in Chicago and in DC. So here's the flow chart of our participant recruitment. And I'm sharing this with you so that the group here understands the, the labor involved and, and what might be some issues in recruitment and retention. So here's the flow chart from the breast health study. We recruited 184 people over those 10 days. So 18 people per day. Out of that, half were consented, right? Half were not eligible, though we, we have listed it, the eligibility criteria. Then you go to the workshop setting, so about 58 people attended the first workshop, then 52 attended the second workshop. And for completion of the intervention, we wanted you to attend both, right? So if you think about the response rate, the response rate is 45%. Out of 184, you had 52 people attending the, uh, the intervention total. The attrition rate, which is 10%, right? So out of this 58, you had six people who didn't show up right here, okay? So you recruit twice the amount of people Right, and then you have for the people that you have at the end, and then you're going to expect 10% of people to drop out. And this is again Muslim women over the age of 40 who are incentivized. Okay, let's think about the organ donation study. Right, so this was in two cities, as I mentioned, four mosques, uh, 750 people almost recruited. Right, out of that, you see huge only a third were consented, a lot of individuals were not consented because of ineligibility or missing information or refusal. Then when you get down to attending the workshop, so from 749, you go down to 75 people attended the completion of the intervention. This is this is a nine-fold draw, ten-fold draw, right? So again, the same calculations. The response rate for initially from two from 749 you had 281 people consented to the study. That's 39%. And then the attrition rate from one session to the second session, 56 persons didn't show, right? 43% dropout rate or attrition rate. A huge phenomenon. So here, we have to recruit ten times the people to finish the intervention. 
Now you can blame it all on the men, but that's not the case, right? The first study was women, but this was also men and women, but huge, a huge drop off. And then even if you came to the first workshop, a huge drop off uh, after that point. So probably incentivized, people got up to $250 to participate here. So what to expect when you're planning your moss based study is that you have intensive amount of recruitment, right? Um, the point here is that we tried in the second study, because of our experience with the first study, to do some online recruitment. This is not a very good modality. 5.5% online signups is not a lot. Through listservs, in the MOS setting, through you know, through having the QR codes, just doesn't work. And then we had actually made a lot of calls. It wasn't just your, we called, sent letters. Um, so the process was when you consent, we send you an email, we send you a text, we have you a letter that all goes out saying the date and time, and then we follow up two or three times. So for recruitment, one to two calls, right? And then you need, sorry, for the phone calls in the breast cancer study, we just need one to two people. Here, for that 750 people, we need three to seven people manning the recruitment strategy. A huge investment, despite the fact that we had 90% you know, of people in the end didn't show up. Consent rates, about half, but look at the nutrition rate. So when you're thinking about interventions, I want you to think about this fact in our community. And to me, it speaks to a culture, right? There were issues, so let me, let me let you know that it wasn't because we were bad people that the people didn't show up here. There was some snowstorm that affected one of the mosques in our, actually two of the mosques in our setting on one of the dates here. But there's still a huge amount of attrition. So these are the challenges, you know, chance you have. These are the challenges, right, for, for a mosque-based PCOR. So sustainability oftentimes is fiscal. When the grant ends, the program ends. There's infrastructural challenges, right, On, ongoing ownership of the intervention program. So we have these research-tested effective programs who is implementing them, right? Is the mosque community then gonna implement them or other mosque communities, right? Is the community, is the healthcare system gonna say, hey, this is effective, let's actually fund some of this work in a community setting. The mosque leadership often changes rapidly in our experience, so then the priorities change. And then there's a lack of connectedness to the healthcare system for the mosque communities themselves. This leads to kind of not adequate, adequate partnership. And then there's a cost effectiveness issue, right? So, so we've talked about community health workers as an integral aspect of what we think would be valuable for mosque communities to engage with to create a culture of health, but how are you gonna support that, right? And there's high rates of participant attrition. So you need these individuals to maintain consistency and sustainability in the programs. So with that, I'm gonna close. I hope I have some time here to engage with the audience. Um, the next steps for us is another project. So successively, you know, we have now went from eMarch to MPART to, I don't know, we couldn't figure out an acronym here. Uh, but this project, I am pleased to be a co-PI with uh, Ayaz Haider from the Ohio State University. I'm going to focus on American Muslim institutions decision-making related to COVID-19. So basically the idea here is that we've partnered with the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding and Islamic Schools of America. We're going to take the mosque PCOR toolkit and we're going to teach them PCOR, these organizations. What our hope is that they will then take PCOR methodologies and embed them within their infrastructure how they think about research and programming that's health and non-health related actually. Then the goal after that is to create a toolkit that would be of value to Islamic schools, both those that are weekend and Sunday schools, as well as those that are fully functioning, you know, uh, five days a week Islamic schools. And then there, there can be another hub for health programming and health research. So that's our goal. I'm going to end there and field any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you for the wonderful presentation. We do have some time for Q&A, and we do have a lot of questions, I believe, in the chat. Sure. Um, from Janice, she said, are male FIT tests effective? Sorry, uh, say that again. I... Are male FIT tests effective or FIT tests? Uh, you, what, what FIT tests are we talking about? Um, I think she was talking about in one of your um, slides in the previous. Janice, can you elaborate on your question a little bit? Um, in the meantime, Fatima has a question. Um, 
Oh, uh, Jenna said for a research project colon cancer. For a research project in colon cancer. Are fecal occult blood testing, is that effective? So uh, there, I'll tell you, I'm not familiar with the newest data, but, but what we learned was that it was equally effective, but perhaps there's new data out there. And I don't want to speak to an area that there might be new studies on there. That's not my, I'm an emergency medicine doctor, not a, a you know, cancer physician. So I don't want to miss uh, on record and say something incorrect, but what we were taught was they were equally effective for men and women. Um, Fatima has a question. She said, so who are being taught PCOR at the Islamic schools? At uh, the Islamic, who will be taught PCOR? Okay. So the institution, right? So our focus on two institutions. The Islamic School of America is a institution itself. It's a nonprofit. And they have school stakeholders that engage with them. So they up, up train, right? Upskill, sorry, upskill school leaders and administrators and convene them for various sorts of activities related to COVID-19 or for how do you teach a certain subject. The hope is that when we talk to this institution and help them understand PCOR methodologies, they will engage and use them in their educational and research programming in the mosque community and in the Islamic school community. So for example, COVID-19, there's been issues around how safely we open schools. Do we need masks? Is there something else going on within the Muslim community, right, around vaccination? So they're doing programming and, and some survey work and some focus group work based on that. We want to teach that institution that's convening these school leaders and administrators and parents and teachers um, to think about PCOR embeddedness within that. So that's the goal. I can look at the chat myself. Bye. Any more questions from the audience? Yeah, I know Omer Shah when he was at Harris County. We know each other. So convey my salam to him, Chaz. He's a wonderful individual. Well, we don't have to keep individuals here if there are no questions. Either I was uh, very clear or I was unclear at all. So there are no questions. I'm okay with that. Um, but I defer to Fatima, who is the convener of this program, uh, if we want to break a little early. So I think the next session is at 2.15 or 2.30? Uh, our next session will be at 2.30, but we do have a break. But before that, we do have another question from Fatima. Um, so I have presented the strategy for Moss Community Health program, Programming. How can we have it disseminated? This is a question for me or a question for the group here. So I think this is part and parcel of our dissemination strategy to have this symposium. You're recording it, right? We have the toolkit up. What we what we would like, I think what Fatha was asking me to do, and I'll do it. That's fine, Fatima. I get it. She wants me to share it with the audience here that you are now change agents yourselves. You have learned a bit of a kernel of knowledge. You have some sense of there's a toolkit out there. We encourage you to disseminate that within your social circles, particularly those that are connected to MOST or health, and to promote the uptake of this toolkit. Now, I'm not saying the toolkit answers everything, but it is a you know experiential based best practices uh, mirroring of project method me management methodologies with PCOR principles, and we encourage you to take that. So I think she wants me to ask you, and I do ask you to please be a change agent and take this into your own communities. All right, so I, I guess I, I, I can have the authority to end our session since there are no questions. I think you can all have a 45 minute break yeah i think that would be good all right so then. thank you everyone for coming to our session um we will have a break for now for a prayer break and lunch break and then we will reconvene at 2 30 where we will have our session with 
PCOR, um, with our PCOR program officer, Courtney Clyatt, as well as leaders from different individuals from different communities who will come and we will have a moderated discussion and Dr. Perdela would also be moderating that sessions. So inshallah, we will see you all at 2.30.